Welcome back to our daily study. We are up to episode 30 and Genesis chapter 30, and we are continuing on in the big narrative of Jacob and his ever-expanding family, um, which was will get even bigger, and there's more uh, sexual mischief and bartering and all sorts of weird stuff like that going on here and deception. So uh, hmm. let's jump right into it. Permi Unless I couldn't tell if you're hitting me or if you have a question. Permission to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll allow it. <laughs> I was kind of saying yesterday that oh, it's everything in your life is kind of an idol. Like, and I we were having a conversation after, and I'm like, yeah, everything in my life is like my job is, my money is, the way I look is, literally everything is an idol. And you said no, not everything is like, and the example you used was. Well, your voice isn't, which is a little rude, but <laughs> yes. Okay, so I let's just say I was speaking in hyperbole. Like, clearly I know everything isn't an idol, but I do think that it's very easy to elevate almost anything in your life to too high a value. So there's, I think that's the way to say it, is everything in your life has idolatrous potential. Yeah. But based on one person to the next, not everything is an idol. Right. So an example that I would, this is a stupid example, but I can't think of a better one right now. But the, so like if somebody said, um, you can tell by what offends you when you get criticized. Mm -hmm. If somebody said to me, James, you're a really bad figure skater. Mm -hmm. I would say, don't care. I mm -hmm. don't even really want to be known as a good figure skater, to be honest. Mm -hmm. If somebody said that to, who's a famous figure skater? Michelle Kwan or Brian, uh -huh. Brian Boitano or whoever, if they said, okay, you're a really bad figure skater, that would probably hit home to them. If they told them you're a really bad preacher, mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't care. But if you said that to me, I would probably take it more personally. Now, what is, what's the difference? I draw more of my identity mm -hmm. out of this particular thing. And that person draws more identity out of figure skating. Mm -hmm. And so the things in your life that you tend to draw more of your value, worth, identity, meaning, purpose. Yes. That, so the everything has idolatrous potential. But the things that you are trying to either make a name for yourself with or the things that give you your hope or your security or your... Mm -hmm. Those are the things that functionally are... Uh, the, the biggest temptation for idolatry mm -hmm. and that differs from one person to the next first of all you are really dating yourself with a brian boitano i'm also i barely know who that is i'm also happy to do that that i have zero knowledge of any current figure skaters secondly i'm trying to think of a criticism someone would give me that it wouldn't annoy me <laughs> <laughs> um i uh there's mm, no I can't think of one. You take everything personally. Well, I would be annoyed. <laughs> if somebody... Just okay. because someone is criticizing me. So maybe my idol is just pride. Right. So like that's potentially a Like thing. I don't even care what it is. Why are you criticizing me? Oh, well, you're right. So I think what I would point to there more is like autonomy. Uh, the idea yes. that I am my own individual right. thing and nobody gets to speak into it at all. Yeah. And so, like, there is such an idol of, of uh, freedom or autonomy, which are slightly different but related, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but point is, it could be any number of different things. And uh, we, I think we mentioned before that American Id idolatry, I even think it's, it is regional and time-specific to some extent, which in the Old Testament, it was always fast, it's always fascinated me that different regions and different nations had different names for different types of gods. Mm -hmm. I am not convinced based on stuff that I've read in recent years that there aren't, so we know that uh, whereas God is omnipresent, mm -hmm. demons are not omnipresent. Their, their work overlaps, but the idea Wait, that, what do you mean? They're not all-knowing? Correct. Yeah. Like, so Satan doesn't know what you're thinking? Absolutely not. Nope. Mm. Um, which is part of the reason why Jesus... Why is he so good at tempting you then? He's a very good sociologist. He's been mm. observing humanity since Adam and Eve. And so he knows the common tricks, which is why his, his tricks are always like shifting subtly. The, the 21st century, like there, in one sense, there's nothing new under the sun. In another sense, mm -hmm. it's constantly mutating as time goes on. So from the modernist era to the postmodernist, postmodern era, there's different attacks on mm -hmm. Christianity. And he just keeps some, some of it he's recycling, some of it he's just morphing. It's, it, 
but my point is Satan ultimately would be seemingly organizing a lot of that, but the idea that there would be regional demons from place to mm -hmm. place. So like for instance, times in eras in history where there have been things like child sacrifice. Yeah. I think there is probably something the it it wouldn't shock me if we eventually got to the point where mm -hmm. we understood that there was a demon who specifically was in charge mm -hmm. of vanity or a demon who was specifically in charge of that's very interesting like those kinds of things i think it's part of the reason why um so obviously christianity is not polytheistic but the ancient world by and large was and the idea that they attributed important things in life or the temptations of them to certain higher powers i think could mm -hmm. be in the realm of angels and demons too <sighs> No, I remember a, a seminary professor, I remember being kind of shocked about it at the time, but he said, no, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that Muhammad saw a vision from a demon and was influenced with the message that he was given. And it, it's led like many, many astray. Um, so like the idea that there would be, again, the idea that there's spirits working good and evil. Mm -hmm. That God is in control and authority over everything, but that they are, these spirit beings have, are, that, that's, the Apostle Paul says, our force, our fight is really against the spiritual forces that exist in this world. Mm -hmm. And um, we know there are things like angels and demons. So um, the idea that some of them would be tempting in certain ways, that they're observing our behaviors and tempting accordingly, uh, none of that's too terribly surprising, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So... I don't even remember entirely how we got on. I wonder if they can make themselves look like people. Like, you know how the angels like can? Like angels. Yeah. We will not be able to super, answer that. That's super scary if they can. In our 20 to 30 minutes here. But, uh, yeah. I mean, the it's like we should be scared. We should be appropriately scared. And, mm -hmm. again, I, you've, if you've been following along, if you're on episode 30 with us already, you know that I, I've probably mentioned before... Uh, most of us were born into an anti-supernaturalistic worldview, a modern Western uh, scientific anti-supernaturalistic. I think that's changing. The postmodern era is younger adults are way more um, receptive to the mm -hmm. idea of supernatural today than people in the mid 20th century were. Uh, it's because of those hunky ghost fighters. They are getting the word out there. What's that show called again? So people Supernatural. Know you're, you're not talking about Ghostbusters, right? No, Supernatural. <laughs> so make sure to read Genesis 30 at home. Uh, Rachel became furious that Leah was allowed to have children, but she wasn't. Uh, so she came to Jacob and said, give me children or I'll die, which is clearly a little bit of an exaggeration in drama. Uh, Jacob was then angry with her and told her, he's not God. He can't simply make a child happen. Rachel then gave her maidservant, Bilhah, to Jacob to have sex with, and that child would then count as Rachel's child. Jacob had sex with Bilhah. He doesn't seem to think, like, no, that's a, pro that's a problem. Uh, so goes ahead and has sex with Bilhah. Had he not had sex with her up until this point? We're not told about it. She was it. technically, like, one of his wives also, right? Or no? Uh, well, no, she was given she as a maidservant. She just came with Rachel. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's hmm. Rachel's decision, seemingly, whether or not she wants to give her maidservant as a concubine. Uh, but Bilhah becomes pregnant. Rachel saw uh, this was God's vindication of what she was doing, which is another really interesting thing about people who look for signs in their life as God's validation or God's... Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure God is not validating this, even though Bilhah is, um, becomes pregnant. Uh, but she nonetheless sees it as God's validation, so she names him Dan. Bilhah conceived again, and Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister, and I have one, so she names him Naphtali. Uh, when Leah stopped having children, she gave her maidservant, Zilpah, to Jacob as a wife. Zilpah became pregnant, and Leah said, what good fortune. She named him Gad. Zilpah became pregnant again and bore a second son. Leah said, how happy am, am I? And she named him Asher. During the wheat harvest, we're told that Reuben went out to the fields and found some mandrakes. So he brought them home to his mother, Leah, and Rachel said to Leah, give me some of your son's mandrakes. Leah said, wasn't it enough that you stole my husband? Now that you want to take my son's mandrakes. Mandrakes, by the way, are uh, kind of... Uh, the myth about them is that they are not only an aphrodisiac, but that they uh, increase fertility. So there's people do the same things today. All sorts of weird, weird things and whatever to, that are not necessarily scientifically proven, but that uh, there's this belief that, well, this influences fertility or mm -hmm. whatever else. 
Uh, it certainly was the case back then. Rachel replied that Leah could have sex with Jacob that night in exchange for the mandrakes. That night when Jacob came in, Leah told him that she had hired him for the night for the price of mandrakes. God listened to Leah and she becomes pregnant. She bore Jacob another son, her fifth son. Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Leah became pregnant again and bore Jacob a sixth son, saying, God has presented me with this gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I have borne him six sons. She named him Zebulun. Sometime later, Leah gave birth to a daughter named Dinah, which is important. We're not told this is the only daughter that she has or that any of the women have, but Dinah is going to become important in a later lesson uh, as kind of a pivotal plot point. God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and she became pregnant. She said, God has taken away my disgrace and named him Joseph. Rachel still desired another son. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob asked Laban to let him go back to his homeland to live with his family. Laban was very reluctant about all this since he had been so blessed by Jacob's presence. So Laban said he learned uh, all of this by divination, that uh, he doesn't want Jacob to go. Laban told Jacob to name his wages and he would meet them. And Jacob argued that he had spent his entire adult life working for Laban and being a blessing to him. And at some point he wants to build something for his own household. Jacob said that he'd continue working for Laban if he simply let him go through the fields and remove every spotted sheep, dark colored lamb, and every spotted goat. And he says, that'll be my wages. Jacob added that he won't cheat on any of it. Only the spotted sheep and goats and dark colored lambs will belong to Jacob. And Laban thinks this is a good deal for him too, so he agrees to it. Laban then went on a journey and Jacob then used the tree branches to create sort of like a cool spot for the flocks to come and drink. And getting them out of the heat also seemingly led them perhaps to mate. They bore young that were spotted. Jacob began dividing the flocks into two groups, Laban's group and his group. Jacob very clearly has, again, sort of cleverly devised a way to ensure that the strong animals that mated would end up going to him and the weak ones would go to Laban. Jacob grew very prosperous. He owned not only large flocks, but many servants, camels, and donkeys. And there is there is our summary for Genesis 30. All right, now, mm -hmm. the, th the three devotional thoughts. Um, number one, Rachel jealous of Leah. Um, Remember, Leah has probably spent, as the less attractive sister, the majority of her life being jealous of Rachel. Mm -hmm. Rachel's the one that always got the attention. Rachel's the one that this guy from out of town who has, you know, has fallen for completely, wants no, nothing to do with her. Uh, Rachel is the one that, even once they got married, um, Jacob, as I mentioned, Jacob's clearly having sex with Leah when he wants her as convenient for him. Uh, she's getting pregnant and all that, but he still clearly doesn't care about her all that much. The, ta the tables have turned here completely, though, uh, because since Leah has borne children to Jacob, Rachel is actually now jealous of her. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've talked about how having children, bearing children is one of the main ways to measure blessing in the ancient world. And all of this is simply a matter of, like, fighting for affection of their husband. Um Leah hates Rachel because Rachel's prettier. Rachel hates Leah because Leah actually is bearing children. And both of them, which again shows the danger of polygamy uh, and mm -hmm. damage is done, but both of them are essentially fighting for that primacy in their husband's eyes. Uh, one of the applications I think here is the pain of comparison. Um, jealousy was making Leah miserable in the last chapter. My husband doesn't love me. He loves mm -hmm. Rachel. Um, Rachel, uh, jealousy is now making Rachel miserable uh, and driving all of her poor behaviors. I think the thing that I'd say is whatever exists in your life that is potentially making you jealous of somebody else, um, just get rid of it. Like if possible, get rid of it. Now you can't always get rid of every, you know, like if it's somebody that you're at work with that you're jealous of, like you can't just get rid of you them. Can't necessarily, <laughs> yes, eliminate them from the office, whatever that means. Um, but I do think there are certain things we just, we're just having a conversation with somebody about the social media usage. Mm -hmm. Um, there are potentially things that create greater jealousy in your life that like, you're just to some extent making yourself miserable, but to another extent, actually putting yourself in temptations away. Mm -hmm. So anything that's creating some level of jealousy, stop looking at it, stop going near it. And as much as possible, repent of it. 
uh, and, and stop letting it be part of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, jealous of Leah and uh, the jealousy aspect here. Number two, Jacob is purchased with mandrakes. This is, I already mentioned the issue of uh, aphrodisiac and infertility, so I won't go into that. But the point is here that, so this is an interesting turn of events where the women are using the man as a sex object. Um, it's, it's, it's a little backwards from what we tend to think the objectification of women is generally, but this is very clearly as an objectification of a man. Um, they don't, like they they would like his affection seemingly, but at this point they're essentially bartering over his his sex, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's it's totally dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And anytime you approach sexuality as a means to an end, whether it's just a means to pleasure, or it's just a means to children, or a means to, as opposed to the covenant rene renewal ceremony that it's like designed to be. Um, it, like people get hurt because it's dehumanizing a very distinctly like human kind of gift. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we have to add any more to that one. Okay. So uh, first bullet, first thought was Rachel jealous of Leah. Second thought was Jacob is purchased with mandrakes. Um, oh, it, again, the application to that one again is, is just this idea that sex, it has to be used according to the it's design. Mm -hmm. Whenever you use any kind of tool outside of the design that it was used, intended to be used, it ends up breaking things as opposed to constructing things. Sex is designed to give life, not uh, like destroy or destruct life. Third uh, devotional thought is Jacob's business savvy. Uh, the last part of this chapter is one of the more confusing aspects, I think, mm. to read in the Old Testament, what exactly Jacob's doing. I know, and I, partially because I haven't found a commentator that, I, I haven't found commenta commentators to be universal in their understanding of what Jacob is doing. They know he's scheming. They know he ends up uh, with good fortune, like God has blessed him. But what exactly he's building there in terms of like the thing with the uh, spotted, speckled, uh, yeah, I goats think just... and lambs, and the, the seemingly he's creating like a place of shade for them. The at the end of the day, it's the mm -hmm. it's God's good fortune, and he comes out ahead on this really weird business relationship. Mm -hmm. But if whether or not there's actual like science attached to it, or it's more just kind of a supernatural gift, is hard to discern. Point is, he has tried to outthink Uncle Laban yet again for his own personal advantages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's probably just breeding the spotted ones more, I would think. I don't know. I think he thinks it's more than that. The, like... I'm certain he... So this is... One of the application points to this is Jacob has a tendency to think that his good fortune is his smartness, his hard work, uh, and his just inherent betterness. Whereas his good fortune is always clearly the hand of the Lord. Um, Jacob's cunning ways tend to be both his greatest strength and his biggest weakness at times. He's in one respect kind of attractively and admirably clever. And in another sense, he is uh, kind of just untrustworthy, like a guy that I wouldn't want to get too close to because I always think he, he would deceptively, you know, he's, he's two faced. And this idea that like in the new Testament, Jesus talks about being as shrewd as snakes, but as innocent as doves. Uh, Jacob is, I think there's a lot of Christians who are as innocent as doves nowadays, but like totally lack shrewdness, don't understand the way the world works and even leverage that the way they're supposed to. Jacob is almost the opposite example. He is uh, a believer who is not as innocent as a dove, mm -hmm. but he is the shrewdest guy and the smartest guy in the room a lot of the time. But again, he thinks his good fortune is always because of his um, outsmarting everyone else, his cleverness. When in reality, it's it's God's hand. And therefore, what I would also say then is don't plagiarize your blessings from God. Um, your blessings don't come primarily because you work harder or you're smarter or you're more talented or you wanted it more or you anything like that. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, you know, comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights. And so don't don't plagiarize God's credit, I guess is what I'd say. Any final thoughts on Genesis chapter 30? Um, no. All right. Will you close us with a prayer? Um, sure. Dear Heavenly Father, um, as
as we talked about, it is so easy to make any good and perfect gift from above into either something we've accomplished of our own doing or just an idol, something that has more importance to us than you do. So please help us to remember that um, you have given us every single opportunity we've had. You know, it's really difficult in this culture, which is so... Um, I can do, I can be anything I want to be and so accomplishment oriented to think that, yep, I became this because I put my mind to it and I worked hard. And that just totally negates, it's almost like a slap in the face to you that we just need to repent of and just be cognizant of that we are in control of nothing. So please help us to remember that and please forgive us for all the times that we don't and we pat ourselves on the back a little too often. Um, thank you for the grace and mercy that you show us in those times and in any other time where we think that we can outsmart you in all of the different ways that we come up with or try. Um, as foolish as you must think humans look, you know, it's even more amazing that you like love us and went through essentially hell and back to get us. So we're forever grateful for that and please help us to keep that at the forefront of every decision we make. Does this glorify me or does this glorify God? Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. We will see you tomorrow for Genesis 31.